Hello, I'm Robert Bastian of Laryngopedia and Bastian Voice Institute. My purpose is to discuss cricopharyngeal myotomy for anti-grade cricopharyngeal muscle dysfunction. It's a surgical procedure for a swallowing disorder. A lot of words there, but I want to make it very clear to you before we finish what we're talking about. So first of all, here's our uh, title slide and uh, if you need further information after we finish this discussion, you can go to Laryngopedia and type the word myotomy into the search window. Uh, when you do that, up comes several uh, posts. The first one here would be the one you would click on that opens up and gives you lots of information and pictures and so forth. Well, what is cricopharyngeal myotomy? Excuse me, what is cricopharyngeal dysfunction antegrade? It's dysfunction of a sphincter muscle in the forward direction. Here you see the sphincter with the star on it in both pictures. It's a disorder of a, a gateway or a, a sphincter is a circular muscle and in you watching this in me right now that sphincter muscle is contracted. It's contracted except at the moment that we swallow saliva, food, or liquid. It lets go briefly and then it clamps shut on the back side. Well, in some older people, that muscle stops letting go fully. And so it's not a problem for saliva, liquids, and very soft things. But the person begins to notice that pills and meat and gummy bread want to hang up here in the throat. And uh, as time passes, unfortunately, the degree of relaxation is less and less and less. And so diet is progressively restricted from the more chunky, solid things. So the person gives up steak, the person gives up chicken, they give up fish, and they eventually get down to basically purees and oatmeal and cream of wheat kinds of consistencies, cream soups. So uh, a person can live with it for a while and then eventually they get to the place where they say, uh, done enough, I've got to do something about this. In some people, there is a hernia. It's not just that the muscle won't let go, but there's a herniation. The pressure causes a weakening in the wall and so they develop this progressive little sac here. Here it is small and here it has gotten quite a large. It's called a Zinker's diverticulum. Well, what are the options for treatment? Once a person says, enough, I'm, I gotta do something about this, what are the options? Well, one is just to carry on as you are, live with it, understand the problem, alter diet, small bites, chew well, lots of sips of water in between. And uh, so some people do that for quite some time. Once they get to the place where they say, I've had it, I've gotta do something about this swallowing problem, then the traditional treatment for many uh, years has been traditional end of, uh, out exterior cricopharyngeus myotomy. So the muscle is approached from the outside, the O of the muscle, which is strangling the passageway, is turned into a U by dividing the muscle fibers on the outside. And so now it's a U and it's no longer strangling or circling the, the esophagus. The more contemporary approach is endoscopic. So we're dividing the same muscle fibers, but from the inside out through the mouth. And there are some real advantages. And that's why we almost always do the procedure endoscopically rather than through the neck. Well, uh, what is the what are the logistics? Oh, by the way, how common is this? Uh, before we get to logistics, how common is it? It's a very rare disorder in most practices, but it's a disorder that we have a very large caseload of at Bastion Voice Institute from a wide region. Well, what are the logistics? It's done in hospital, uh, could be done uh, as an outpatient, and we have done it, but almost always we do it in hospital. It's under general anesthesia, fairly short procedure, but you have to be fully asleep. It's done through the mouth. The chin is lifted and we go through the mouth with a hollow lighted tube. And uh, the laser is coupled to a microscope. So we're using high magnification. The laser beam acts in the, in the same plane as our vision. And so we can see uh, under high magnification and we divide the muscle fibers using this uh, light beam. 
at the conclusion of the procedure, before you're awakened, there is a suction tube placed in the area of the wound, and that suction tube is brought out through the nose. You're not aware of it, of course, and the purpose of that is to protect you in the initial hours after the procedure. So suction tube from the nose uh, when you wake up. Well, uh, what are the risks of the procedure? Well, uh, general anesthesia is always a risk, uh, but it's an exceedingly tiny risk. Uh, you know, if you're here at the office seeing us, uh, the risk of driving home is likely greater statistically than the risk of general anesthesia, but nevertheless, there is a tiny risk from general anesthesia. There's a small risk of dental injury because we have to put some pressure on these upper central teeth. We use a tooth guard and a lot of care, of course, but every few years we'll have someone where there's a little chip or a little rough area, usually people whose uh, anatomy is very difficult and the, the visualization has been quite difficult. Dental injury, very uncommon. Bleeding, we expect the blood loss to be a, a couple of teaspoons, maybe a, a few teaspoons, but every now and again it's several tablespoons. And so uh, that's just the, the spectrum of, res of difficulty we encounter intraoperatively. So bleeding is at risk. Subcutaneous air is the big one. Remember, there's going to be a wound inside the upper part of your esophagus, and so if you were to cough hard postoperatively against back pressure, so you're not letting the cough out fully, but you're you're sort of resisting it like a <laughs> like you're you're pushing backwards, then you can blow air into the tissues of your neck and create subcutaneous air. It's sort of like Rice Krispies or miniature bubble wrap in the tissues of the neck, and sometimes the neck swells. Uh, that's why we have the suction drain. One of the reasons we have that suction drain in place is to protect you. But we ask everyone who's undergoing this surgery to practice what we call triple decker or Big Mac coughing, sneezing, and burping. So instead of <coughs> we're going to do <coughs> cough with the mouth wide open, if you sneeze instead of a, 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 a as some people do, it's a, 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 a it's not a very satisfying way to sneeze, but it's important to let all that air out and not uh, back pressure it. Uh, and then finally, there's always a risk of infection anytime we do surgery. And one particular kind of infection is called mediastinitis. It has been reported. Thankfully, we've not yet encountered it in our population. And again, our suction drain is trying to help us with the infection and the subcutaneous air. How long are you in hospital? Well, most people, it's just going to be overnight. You come in on the day of surgery, have the surgery, stay that evening and through the night. The next morning, we come by, and as long as you're able to take sips of liquid around the suction tube, and as long as we don't feel any swelling or, or that bubble wrap kind of uh, subcutaneous air, out comes the drain, and away you go home. Occasionally, we come around, it's quite uncommon, but occasionally we do feel a little of that swelling or that bubble wrap. That person has to stay in a hospital three to five days. It's really for observation because if the person has blown a little air in the, into the neck and they don't know how they did it and the suction drain wasn't quite adequate to, to keep it from uh, collecting, then how do we know they're not going to go home and do more of that? And so that's why we have to keep you in hospital for a few days to monitor for that. Um, what about pain? Well, pain, uh, experience of pain varies a lot between patients no matter what the surgery is. So it's variable. So once in a while we come by and the person, you ask about the pain and the patient, the patient is kind of stoical or they have a high pain tolerance and they kind of say, well, doctor, it's pretty sore, uh, but I'm okay. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum is the person who says, oh, doctor, my goodness, this is painful. Every time I swallow, it's like razor blades in my throat. And so when you watch them swallow, they'll kind of go, it's sort of like after tonsillectomy. So we sort of tell everybody that it might be like the, the severe end of the spectrum so that nobody's surprised. Do expect it to be quite, quite sore. How do we manage that? 
Well, the evening, the afternoon and evening of the procedure and all through the night, you have what's called patient-controlled analgesia. There's a pump beside your bed and you have a little button that you can push when you want to. Of course, there are limits to the amount we allow you to have, but you get to push the, the button and administer the pain medicine to yourself. The following morning, when we come by, again, assuming no subcutaneous air and you're able to swallow liquids around the tube, then out comes the, the NG tube and we give you oral pain medicine and make sure that you can manage on that degree of pain relief before you go home. So you're usually with us several hours after the drain comes out to make sure you're still able to sip liquids and the pain control is adequate. The pain is significant, but the worst is over in about five days. Uh, and so it's one of those uh, things that you just have to kind of get through uh, because we're on the way to a big improvement in your quality of life. <clears throat> well, what about eating and drinking? Well, the day of the procedure, you do liquids around that little suction tube. And each time you swallow the liquids, you know, your your tube in your nose, you have to pinch it. It's a very soft tube, so you have to pinch it because otherwise you drink your liquids and it goes and it sucks right out through the drain. So uh, you you just pinch the tube soft. You pinch it for 30 seconds or so while you're taking your sips and you do liquids the day of the procedure. And then uh, at, uh, at in the morning and on discharge, full liquids and soft foods as tolerated. So people do smoothies, they do yogurt, applesauce, nectars, fruit nectars, cream soups, things that are very soft and very easy. And usually we suggest that you chase or you rinse the, the wound with a clear liquid at the end of each feeding. And then you advance. Uh, sometimes by the time we get to three or four days, people are taking soft foods, shirred eggs and, and things like that, and oatmeal, uh, things like that, ice cream. Uh, now, how much improvement should you expect? It depends very much on the pitcher catcher profile. That is your particular pitcher catcher profile. By the time you're watching this video, you've probably seen Swallowing Trouble 101. If not, go to Laryngopedia and type in the number 101 and up comes a video that explains the idea that swallowing simplified greatly has a pitcher, the cheeks, the tongue, and the throat are going mm, and they're doing the pushing or the pitching of the bolus downwards. And the catcher is the sphincter muscle which has to open to receive. So in s many people with a uh, catcher problem, the pitcher is also not working very well. They kind of go together. But if your pitcher is perfect and all that you have wrong is your catcher, then we would expect you to have a perfectly normal swallowing experience just like anybody else in the world. But if your pitcher isn't working very well as well, and we'll tell you that, then you won't get perfect swallowing, but maybe much improved swallowing, a big an expansion of what you can eat uh, to add solid foods. So we can usually give you a sense of your particular pitcher catcher profile. Uh, and just remember that the surgery we're doing is only to fix the catcher. It's not doing anything to the pitcher. So again, look at Swallowing Trouble 101 uh, if you want to know more. What are your home instructions? You're going to do your diet as tolerated, primarily those liquidy and soft things that we just described, and kind of be guided by what works and what doesn't work. And then you're going to be sure to continue that open mouth, the, the, the triple decker <coughs> cough and sneeze for a minimum of three days. And uh, then you're going to contact your doctor if you have any fever or chills, inability to swallow, or any new chest pain. If you have that sort of shooting pain into your chest right in recovery room and, and from the beginning, we don't pay too much attention to that. But if you develop that and it's new after the second or third or fourth day, you must let your doctor know right away. And of course, there's going to be a follow-up in the office and a follow-up barium study, usually six to eight weeks after the procedure to, to uh, verify that, that things are working well for you. Well, that's a big discussion. And so 
Again, if you want more information, go to Laryngopedia and type the word myotomy in. But uh, hopefully this has been instructive and will bring you to the procedure feeling well prepared and well educated about what to expect. So thank you very much for listening.